thank you organizers from, uh, for allowing uh, to, to talk in this uh, uh, conference, in this meeting. I've been, I'm a physicist, experimentalist physicist, uh, some, do some theory. I've been in physics conferences, math conferences, chemistry, biology. I've never been to such a, a conference, and it seems already that uh, it will be the, one of the most influential uh, meetings for me um, uh, for, my, for my research. Um, so uh, I'm working at the Hebrew University, and uh, uh, physics department, uh, and uh, I will talk about, I changed the, the title to more general title, uh, more relevant for this meeting, about shape, movement, and mechanics of what we call frustrated elastic sheets. Basically, it seems like a common interest for all of us is, is shape, shape of solids, and how can we manipulate shape in a non-traditional uh, ways. Uh, and what we see here is this uh, living-like uh, thing, which it's not a cycle, so there are some cycles of the movies, but uh, it is periodically a com completely autonomous creature in a, in a solution. It takes three dimensions uh, uh, upon its pace. It, it, it consumes energy from the, from the environment, and uh, I will talk about these things. The work was done by my students, ex-students, and uh, my co-workers. So, uh, <clears throat> We will talk about things of surfaces uh, like this that uh, are, are common uh, and we all know them, uh, and ask how they shape themselves. We know that we can fold easily thin sheets or thin, thin papers into shapes, but these are not folded externally, but they grow this way and shape themselves. Um, many examples for, for different uh, systems of this type, biological ones, uh, kneading, uh, this is a single cell in, a, in an own of some plant that upon drying, it curls. Uh, other examples in a millimeter scale, a pneumatic elastomer, which Shu just mentioned, and on a much, much smaller scale of 50 nanometers here, this is a molecule self-assembled uh, by, by Ming-Ming Zhang in my lab. Uh, and again, all these things attain non-trivial sometimes beautiful, sometimes useful, uh, three-dimensional shape by themselves. And if we think of all of these, then these are mechanical objects. They obey the laws of mechanics. And in, in this type of regime, they obey the, the laws of elasticity. Uh, but there's additional, addition, additional information encoded in these, uh, in addition to elasticity, which encodes some internal geometry within the tissue, each piece of the tissue, which all together emerge into a global shape. So this will be our subject. I will skip all this uh, uh, characterization. And then we can go, uh, if we talk about uh, extending the context and we think about machines or, or movement of structures that traditionally man-made structures move by rotation, sometimes translation of rigid elements uh, in our bodies like structures. Sometimes you can attach a flexible membrane to a skeleton in order to achieve smooth and, and uh, flexible structures. But when we look at things like, like this marine snail or these flowers, which by the way operate co on completely different mechanisms, this is a different type of shape transforming structure, a different type of a machine. What's, what's going, there's no skeleton here. So the principle here is this. There is a global shape change of the entire body. It is generated by the distribution of local active deformation, inelastic deformation, muscles, liquids, other things, which uh, as all, each pixel is glued to the other, uh, eventually the entire collection of pixels attains some global configuration. It's very uh, common in natural uh, organs and hardly used in man-made structure. Now, this is an old slide. So this was true a few years ago where there was no theory to handle such objects and there was very little knowledge on how to program material. Suppose I know what I want them to do. And both, uh, th these were the topics where we, we focused our interest and 
actually in this meeting and, and lab tours yesterday, uh, definitely it can be said that there is a big, big progress in, in both directions. So here is a piece of a hydrogel in a Petri dish, which just increase and decrease the temperature, and it attains these helical uh, configurations, and I will talk about it later. So I will start with uh, describing the theoretical framework for what we call the incompatible elasticity or incompatible elastic sheets. First, geometry, and then mechanics. These are two separate, uh, in a way, uh, components of the problem. Uh, each of them alone is not sufficient. I will describe experimental techniques, uh, how to build such structures, how to control them, uh, and say a few words about the characteristics of this combined approach uh, I will introduce, and then show some examples. So, <clears throat> I forgot to bring with me, but imagine you have a sheet of plastic, a very common thing, you just tear it. And then you look at a generated edge, it looks something like this, wave upon wave upon wave, multi-scale, uh, three-dimensional structure. Not confined, not constrained, no one bent it, it wants to be this way. If you do a controlled experiment, you can have, you can sit, you can go between generations, like small wave and, and on a bigger one, three generations of wave, etc. You look around and you see that in many plants you see, uh, and leaves, you see the same typical structure, wave upon wave. This is the plastic sheet. These are uh, different plant uh, tissues. And you can ask, what's the, how, what can I learn from this? What's the principle here? <clears throat> so here is a, an a image of an edge of a saran wrap, like thin plastic sheet torn. And uh, this is, we see this multi-wave configuration. Now we will zoom in a constant factor on the left shoulder of this guy, and this is what we see. We keep on zooming, keep on zooming, keep on zooming, so we see kind of a fractal, a multi-scale structure that emerges spontaneously from a tearing uh, uh, process. So uh, how can we understand it and as physicists? How, what kind of theory and framework can we build to understand and then further to manipulate and design such structures in which complicated three-dimensional structures emerge seemingly spontaneously from some processes. So if we think of it, it's not a rubber, it's a plastic. When we deform plastic, we change equilibrium distances within the, within the sheet. So uh, we will think of yeah, this process in which we tore the plastic sheet is actually we redefined equilibrium distances between points on the surface, and that's all. The rest was relaxation of, this, of the sheet in space. We can measure it. This is a plastic sheet. This is the propagating tear. And this is the original distance between four points uh, ahead of the crack. And look what happens along, uh, as we uh, go near the crack. This distance is elongated in an irreversible way because it is a plastic sheet. It is long along the edge, shorter a bit further, and shorter deeper, and we can measure it. We can measure the ratio of the, orig of the actual to the original and give it a, 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 a name of function of the distance from the edge and plot it. So what we see here, yeah, the edge is longer than it used to be, and after some typical distance, it goes back to its original way. And that's all. So we redefine distances via the tearing process. So uh, how can we link it to three-dimensional shape? That's the, the issue. And the key here is Gauss theorem, the most important uh, uh, theorem in differential geometry, which actually started this fascinating uh, mathematical field. So it links between two types of uh, structures. One of them is the metric. Um, think of it as a mathematical object which defines uh, distances uh, in, a, in, a, in a neighborhood, distances between points. How to measure distances. It's, it's a ruler uh, and tell you how to measure uh, distances in the surface. We can manipulate, if we change equilibrium distances, we actually determine a metric. It could be via growth, swelling, reorientation of material, many, many different things. And 
the metric field is, is uh, yeah, so metric field will des describe this, this type of changes in the sheet. The other thing <coughs> is a shape. The output is a shape, three-dimensional shape in space. It is characterized by the curvature field. And it has uh, the principal curvature. These are details which those of you who are not familiar, don't, don't be bothered by them. Just remember that curvature is related to shape. Metric is related to changes in the distances in the plane. You can define the product of these two. This is the Gaussian curvature. So again, here it is, it appears as a property of the shape. But the connection which Gauss made, he, sh he showed not just that, but how the Gaussian curvature is completely determined by the metric. Meaning, if I manipulate distances in the plane, I specify to some extent, not each one of these, but the, the product, the shape. So when we manipulate and change distances in the plastic sheet, or in the flower, or in the knitting, or in the pneumatic elastomer uh, material, we actually prescribing a property of three-dimensional shape, then the, sh the sheet would go out of the plane even we, if we don't constrain it. Okay, so applying this to our case, this is our torn plastic sheet. W before tearing, a distance between two elements was just Pythagoras term, right? Uh, the x squared plus the y squared. But we said that we redefined the x to be a function of y, this f of y. So this was our deformation. Local, it is local, and that's it, that's the input. We created a new sheet with a new intrinsic geometry, which is expressed by this. We plug it, so you could look at it as a transformation. We had one here, one here. Now, this is a two one. Now we have some f of y and one here. This is the, 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 the presentation of the metric. This is how it measured length. Applying Gauss term to this thing, we get this very simple expression. The Gaussian curvature prescribed by this metric is this way. Second derivative of this growth function f normalized with a minus sign. So first of all, remember our functions were not linear. They, were, they had a second derivative. So the plate is no longer Euclidean. It has a Gaussian curvature as an intrinsic property of it. It has a ne it's negative everywhere. And we can explain now the spontaneous buckling out of the plane, but definitely we cannot explain what is this complexity of wave upon wave upon wave upon wave. Because look, f this function, this metric depends only on y. It is invariant along the direction, but still the solution, the shape, had this high variation along the edge. So we need to go further. This is not enough. This is the, the driving force, but it's not completely, that's not the, determined the response. So now we should ask, can we always find a simple global surface with this property? This is a purely mathematical question. It goes to the embedding problem of how to embed surfaces of n dimensions in spaces of m dimensions, a, 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 a problem that was studied extensively. And the answer to this type of questions is not simple, uh, but doable uh, together with mathematicians. The important thing is to, to understand that we could think of all these surfaces that we want them to shape themselves as such. We induce some process which we designed it, it, it generates some intrinsic geometry within the sheet. Following Gauss term, it can be converted into morphological properties like the Gaussian curvature. And then there is a question, what shapes can the sheet attain to fulfill this, uh, this uh, uh, demand? Sometimes this will be simple. Sometimes the constraints of our Euclidean space are severe and force the sheet to crinkle and crumple. I will give an example. So consider, um, consider now uh, we grow a tube or a, a flower by having a ring of cells and we add other rings on top of it and we let the number of cells grow. If they grow linearly, it will be like a cone envelope, right? We let them grow without any control, so exponentially fast. 
So the perimeter grows faster, 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 and we get this surface, which is known as a pseudosphere. But look what happened. Once we are fully open, there's no way. The next step we, which, which we want is to glue a, a ring with a perimeter larger, longer than 2 pi r, onto this ring of radius r. And there's no axisymmetric shape that will do this. So even though the growth was exactly the same everywhere in all these places, we see that because of constraints of the availability of shapes in space, something must happen. And we could guess that something like this will happen. And indeed, you can do experiments. I will say about them, uh, I will describe them in a moment, and simulation. And you can grow such surfaces up to a point where it's boring. What you put, this is what you get. But when you go beyond it, you break the symmetry and you get complexity, uh, which is selected by the sheet. And you might ask whether uh, many biological uh, plant uh, surfaces are generated this way. Uh, I will very quickly skip and just mention that it is relevant to plant growth. Uh, though this is more complex uh, structure, you can apply growth hormone along the edge of a growing leaf, which is naturally flat, and then hope it stays there, induce enhanced growth, a metric, non-Euclidean metric, and this is a demonstration with eggplant leaves. Uh, after we applied oxine, the, the growth hormone along the edge, we got this multi-wave uh, three-dimensional structure. Uh, I, this is the only thing I will talk about growing plants uh, this, this time. Now, <clears throat> I talked only about geometry, and this is only half of the story. Eventually, it's a mechanical object. We need to, to, to obey the laws of mechanics and to minimize energy in the case of equilibrium. So we need to handle uh, these physical sheets with elasticity, with the theory of elasticity. And we will use the theory of plate and shells. So we consider thin plate, thickness T, uh, and we can compute, the, the plate mechanics would tell us in general that if you want to know the energy of a, of a configuration, you simply need to integrate some energy density over the entire surface, and you know this is the energy. You want to know what will be the shape of equilibrium. It will be the one with the least energy. You need to minimize elastic energy. So the, the shape of this energy density or thin object is special. It has two terms. One is called the stretching term and one is the bending term. The stretching is associated with changes of distances in the plane. Imagine you have springs, you, you connected springs and you, you model this as a, as a sheet of springs. If you stretch springs, you, you pay energy. So this is the strain and you pay energy. It is linear with the thickness. If you bend the sheet, even without changing the length of the, of the springs in the central plane, you stretch the top ones, you compress the, the lower ones, you pay energy, you pay bending energy, it is proportional to the curvature square and to the thickness cube. So when we talk about thin sheets, this is very stiff. This is a tiny factor, like a, a, a very fa to the third power, something small to the third power will be tiny. It is very floppy, we can feel it by hand, but it's not zero. And then if we make these two terms conf conflict, and cannot, we cannot zero this and zero that, they, there is a conflict and shape is selected. So uh, shape selection is, based by is, is generated by competition of these two energy terms. So if all these patterns, all these things, uh, uh, there are types of, of solutions to the same functional, to the same elastic problem under different confinement. We make these two compete, and this is the selection. Crumpling, where energy is focused into points and, and lines. Wrinkling, multi-scale wrinkling, many, many things. And this is, all of this is in flat uh, uh, sheet. These are not our growing sheets. These are sheets that are flat, but we confine them. So we would like to build a, a formalism of this type for our sheet. And the way, uh, what we need to account, so we want it to be a thin sheet like, uh, like, uh, like plate 
uh, theory, describe the elasticity, but also describe this intrinsic geometry. We will call it growth. And the way we do it is uh, going back to the basic formalism of elasticity, which is a, a, a field theory and um, yeah, I, I will not get into the details, but we do not describe a configuration or a state of a system using its shape in space, which is usually done in linear elasticity, but we use what is known as the fundamental forms of a surface. This, the same, this metric and curvature which we met before. So this is our energy density. And uh, this is our stretching term, which we saw before, bending term, which we saw before. They are just written and expressed differently, not in terms of displacement of shape, but in terms of these objects. These A's are metric tensors, metric field. A bar is the one which we talked about, the one encoded in the rest length of the springs. If I, if I know for each spring what its length, I write it down as this A bar. A is the actual length of a spring in a given configuration. Same, same with the curvature. So the bars are reference, uh, uh, reference fields, and A and B are the actual one. The rest is just the same as conventional plate theory. So let's look at this. And, what, and why do we call these incompatible uh, sheets? So growth or any man preparation of material will dictate these bars, and the system chooses a configuration, a shape, which is A and B. So these together, they, they define a configuration. And if we don't have the same thing, A is not equal, by, uh, we stretch spring, we pay energy. That's the only thing. So first thing is to ask, why not simply have A equals A bar, B equals B bar, zero energy, end of story. And this is indeed what happens in most man-made prepared structure where they are properly annealed and selected to, to, have, to be free of residual stresses. But if we tune and select A bar and B bar in a specific way, it is impossible. Why? Because A and B must obey a and B, they form a configuration. They must obey Gauss term. There is a link between them. Specific one, we will leave it. A bar and B bar has nothing to do with this. They just associate it with local deformations. So uh, if they do not fulfill Gauss demand, the, you, we cannot find a configuration A and B in which both will be zero. So we have a conflict between the two terms and they compete and shape is selected. So the same principle just happened naturally without confinement. It seems like, might seem like, you know, exotic or whatever, but this is the default. This is the default when material is prepared unless we carefully anneal it, unless we carefully treat it in order to avoid this bad situation in which material works and deforms as we, as we play with it. But now once we know how to connect these fields with the three-dimensional shape, we can use it in order to design three-dimensional shape in which we, the material will cooperate with us. I will skip this thing, just mention, again, as usual, thin limit, when, then we, we really obey the metric. Thick limit, we obey the curvature. And if they are incompatible, if they, are, they don't tell us the same story, we will have from the same material, with the same internal geometry, just different thickness, we will have different solutions. So this type of materials, they can investigate a very broad range of shapes. Um, how do we uh, realize these things? So first realization was done by Yael Klein, my student, uh, with uh, N-isopropyl acrylamide, a gel that shrinks a lot at at uh, 33 centigrade, uh, and the level of shrinkage depends on its component. Don't bother about the details. So you can take a mixer, mixer and mix com solution from here and from here to play, to, to position yourself around on this curve while injecting it into a gap between two glass plates. It polymerizes, then you take it out. It's a flat gel, 
but it, is, it has some information. Like Shu said before, there's some in, in, in intelligence in this because it is programmed to shrink differently at each location depending on what we put in. And then you can activate it in uh, hot water, increase the temperature, and there you activate this hyperbolic metric in this case, cooling it back, it goes back to its flat configuration, and you can do the math for it. It's not just a qualitative thing, but definitely you can compute the metric, you can design it to have specific Gaussian curvature distribution. And with this, you can build different three-dimensional structures and basically use it or think of it as a new method of configuring uh, structures. Um, I will skip this one. Uh, for physicists, there are interesting questions here, especially related to when do you get simple solutions and when you get complexity and something which is not expected. So you can do quantitative uh, uh, study of surfaces with the same geometry, same Gaussian curvature, positive and negative, and you see that the positive is a boring case. Just the, the shell, the dome becomes more and more perfect, but the negative converts from single saddle to multi saddle. There is a refinement of the structure, and this is in a way some open question um, in, in physics. Another thing is the mechanical properties of these structures, which are unlike anything we know from conventional compatible structures. Very crazy uh, behaviors, and, and, uh, which I will not talk about. So, uh, next. Uh, now more applicative and more relevant for, for our meeting, you can now improve things. Uh, so, for, for example, you can uh, uh, cross-link the gel with a UV-sensitive catalyst. So if you make a, a mask, you get an inhomogeneous uh, disk, and when you heat it, you get this old look smiley thing. Uh, you can do it quantitatively. This is work by Do Levine. So these are different masks. These are different shapes of the resultant uh, structures. And a, a very impressive, uh, a much more elaborate and uh, accurate uh, realization of the same principles were done in, in Amherst by, uh, in Ryan Hayward's lab. This is a submillimeter surface, again, cross-linked <coughs> with UV. Uh, and these are the surfaces generated. You could also implement fibers in different orientations in order to manipulate the curvature, uh, this B-bar thing, and uh, in a controlled way, plug it into the elastic energy functional compute and get the solution. Here, in, in recent years, there's, there are many, many, many uh, beautiful examples of more and more ways to implement this concept. This is from Tim White's lab, pneumatic elastomers, uh, 3D printing, I think the moment 3D printing became uh, compatible with this concept, you could put the material you want in the point where you want it to be. This is a fantastic way to program materials. You just now need to implement these concepts in, in this uh, uh, thing. This is a beautiful work by our uh, organizer. Uh, you could think of, uh, of pasta that, uh, that would change their shape this way. Uh, from shoes lab, uh, uh, you could use a pneumatic elastomer to form these faces. Uh, beautiful work of, of uh, uh, it's called Baromore from Benoit Roman's lab in, in Paris in ESPCI, where you prepare structures that you inflate them and they change their shape uh, because of non-uniform expansion of swelling. And here is an example, another recent example from uh, using uh, um, dielectric uh, uh, polymers in, that, again, you can actuate very quickly uh, shapes. But all of these are not... Uh, how am I about with time? Oh. Okay. So all of these are not things like this. We can ask, can we bring it closer to biology? So here there's no external actuation, right? Something is going on within the material which eventually co co is converted into... A, a change of shape. Uh, same thing here with the, uh, the heart, if we think of it. Okay, the sound is not important here. This is just how I downloaded it. And uh, so how these things work? Very briefly. There is 
a, a chemical signal going within the sheet called action potential, which when it goes in a certain place, the muscles shrink and the, the front propagates. Uh, so, uh, so a propagating action potential, uh, blah, blah. It's not really important that it is an action potential. It's important that it is a propagating front which locally induces the formation. So we can summarize it by this propagating front that locally induces a, a contraction. This is what we would like to do. And we used a material that we did not develop. It's called a BZ gel. Uh, we used the Bolos of Jabotinsky reaction, which spontaneously generate fronts that, and prop that propagate within gels. But the gel is brought in the two, this is this orange thing, to the condition in which where the front is on or off, it will have different volume, uh, uh, equilibrium volume. So this is uh, our guy, this busy creature, uh, spontaneously generating the fronts which spontaneously convert its three-dimensional shape. And uh, so this is busy solution, the gel, the reaction is only within the sheet and um, it goes very slowly, so this is accelerated. Um, you could uh, ask, can we now use our theory in order to connect the field with a three-dimensional shape? And uh, in a way, yes. So these are 3D scans of the, of the surface and computation of the Gaussian curvature, the computed and the actual one. I will not spare time on this. Uh, what should I skip? Uh, very quickly, very quickly, because I think this is an important thing. Uh, it's a ve the characteristics of this approach, first of all, it's an intrinsically nonlinear, geometrically nonlinear approach. Very different from any uh, linear elasticity approaches. But in addition, it's very general. So if we think of what we do is this. Uh, we, we, you have a material which undergoes some uh, change local change according to the way you prepared it. Basically, it, you take the original, suppose it was flat, original metric, and you operate some deformation of it, all these functions. I don't know what they are, you will know, you will program them. Same with the curvature. So, uh, the important, we, we will skip all these things. The important quantity to compute is the Gaussian curvature distribution prescribed by, by this metric. So, for example, in the gels, the gels, they swell and shrink isotropically. So if these are two pixels, now we will activate them. They will, uh, they will grow, but in different ratio because this is how we prepare them. It's very easy now to go to this thing and write the deformation. So the metric used to be, this is in polar coordinate, one R square, but now there is a swelling factor, which is a function of position. When you apply Gauss term to this, you compute exactly what should be the Gaussian curvature. And this allows you to, uh, uh, to design surfaces with desired Gaussian curvature. Actually, in this uh, university, there is a, a very useful rapid code to do these things. Uh, same thing you could do with, the, with B bar. For pneumatic elastomer, and I will do it very quickly, the deformation looks like this. There is a director field and it shrinks along one direction, expands along the other. You can write it. It shrinks along the one direction, it expands along the other. This is when the coordinate system is along this direction. But we want it in the lab frame, when we design the picture of lines in order to get a shape. No problem, these are tensor. This is the benefit of the covariance sh uh, uh, character of the, of the uh, formalism. So we simply can rotate this tensor using the rotation operator. Here is our metric then. And then we can apply Gauss term and compute the Gaussian uh, curvature, et cetera, et cetera. Um, let's do this one thing, last thing, very quickly. A material prepared by nature, seed pod, which keeps seed safe as long as needed. And when summer comes, it shoots them and spreads them. How does it make? What, what, what's the, uh, this, this smart material? What's its structure? Can we understand it quantitatively with our model? So first thing is to f find these two things. What are these fields? 
And you can do it by cutting, by looking at microscope. Apparently, there are two layers here of fiber material, fibro material, top and bottom. And we learn from our botanist colleagues that when they absorb and expel water, this is what happens. This is what they do. And indeed, you can see that there are two, two directions orthogonal to each other, that in which one it bends this way, and the other one that way. So that's all. Can this structure explain what we see? So we can plug it into our formalism. Details not important. And then build this gel which mimics this thing. Again, we have fibers, top and bottom layers in two or, uh, oppos uh, or orthogonal directions. And indeed, you can get the, these shapes. You can make toy models by stretching latex sheets perpendicularly and glue them and then start cutting from them different, in different angles and you get this zoo of shapes. All of them can be solved analytically by the, the same theory. And as you see, the same material, just different orientation, different dimensions, leads to different shapes. This is a property of this frustrated material, which is not like compatible stress-free materials. You can take the data from the seed pod, from the rubber, and, and put it in a dimensionless form. Again, not, not critical here to understand it. Compute analytically, measure synthetic structures, and measure the seed pod, and see that you can explain uh, all these uh, range of shapes that this system attains. A an important thing that uh, related to this is that you realize that the same spontaneous curvature if you rotate your coordinate system, it looks like a spontaneous twist for those who, who, who see it. If not, just take it. So there is a complete analogy between like subtle curvature and spontaneous twist of a surface. You can see it from this image. But this brings us to the world of self-assembled chiral molecules, which have understood that they might have some spontaneous twist. Uh, and uh, much of the pheno pheno phenomenology uh, found in these systems, like chemist, you see twist, go to helical, go to tube, can be recovered and computed by, uh, this is a gel structure, macroscopic, of course, and you can uh, now quantitatively analyze these type of structures using uh, uh, electron microscopy uh, on a much, 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 much smaller scale. And again, the same approach, the same tools are relevant to this. And I would like to end <coughs> with two more slides uh, related to, to a more recent interest uh, of mine. Uh, design, if these are new material, do new ways to treat material, could they be relevant to other disciplines like design, architecture, etc.? even art. So these are works by Dana Zelig, in which we combined a gel with fabric and got these uh, bio-like structures that evolve with temperature. Another work with Shira Shoval and Ariel Blonder, uh, uh, they had this exhibition about frustrated uh, materials, uh, generated different panels of structures that would deform into three dimensions, uh, etc. This field, which I called act, shape by active deformation, really relevant to, to beyond math and physics, to biology, to design, to chemistry, I believe. And this is why we interact with uh, other disciplines. Uh, I would like to end with this beautiful uh, video made by uh, Dana Zelig. Uh, not talking about the science of it, but apparently these structures have also aesthetical qualities which are unique.
thank you.